Hello, my name is Brian Portilla and I am a professor in the master's program in teaching English as a foreign language at Universidad ICES. This master's program will allow the participants to reflect, understand their own teaching practices while also understanding their local settings in this globalized world where education and foreign language teaching is evolving rapidly. The training, the possibilities to discuss and the different interactions that you will have in this master's program will also allow you to theoretically ground your discussions and provide new perspectives about what is happening in your context. Among the different transformations that you will get in this program, I can identify three of them. The first will be that there will be a transformation that is a pedagogical one. You will be able to provide informed views and articulate discussions about current issues in foreign language education. Second, there will be an important transformation at the didactic level. You will be able to transform and you will be able to intervene your classroom practices while allowing students to obtain their objectives and improve in their language proficiency levels. Finally, there will be a significant transformation in your level of English. This master's program is taught in English and the interactions, experiences and different discussions that we will have in the classroom and the materials that you will be uh, encountering in this program are in English. This will allow you to have an improvement in your academic discourse and the proficiency level that you have. The invitation is on. Contact us. I am sure that you will have a very nice experience joining this program. Bueno, muy bien. Ah, hello. I'm sorry. I'm reading the chat. Angeli is writing in Spanish. Uy, Carlos Vargas, you're here to remind me that I need to, uh, that you're going to give me your thesis, right? Okay. Mm. So I'm going to introduce to you my friend Carolina Rodriguez. Um, she has worked at different places. She's a Bogotana. She holds a bachelor in teaching English and a master's in, and a couple masters, one in teaching English and the other one in in, in educación. ¿Cómo es? Educación amorosa. Positiva. Educación positiva. Educación positiva. Um, she's a teacher. She's a professor in our master's in teaching English as a foreign language program. She's the ICT lady. She's very good at all that has to do with using technology and flipped learning. She's a book author. She travels the world presenting her ideas. She's very popular on the social media. And we are very proud to call her a teacher, a professor in the programs. And today she will be discussing um, all of those issues that we learned in pandemic, how do we continue using them while we have to get back to reality, to face-to-face -to -face classes. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for saying yes. Whenever I ask you, I invite you. Now, I'm really happy and honored to be here. Thank you for... Um, Having me in the team, I'm very proud to say when people ask me, where do you work? I'm like, I work at the best universities. In, in Colombia. Colombia. <laughs> yes, because <laughs> I work at Universidad de Cesi, and I happen to work at Universidad de Los Andes here in Bogota as well. Yeah, um, so it's it's very um, honoring and, and it's a privilege, absolutely. But thank you so much for always trusting my work. And definitely, I could never say no to Isesi. I, I absolutely love to work here and to have contact with the students here. It's been a great experience. I think I've been working here for uh, three years, two years, thanks to the pandemic, because before the pandemic, I couldn't do it because I'm, I'm based in Bogota, so I could not travel every week. But once it all became virtual, then this became an opportunity and a reality for me. So yeah, I'm really excited to be part of the program. And today, well, the idea is to offer a space. Thank you, teachers, for being here on a very, well, in my case, a very cold afternoon. People who are in Cundinamarca might be experiencing the same rain. Um, but definitely all these spaces that you are giving to yourself, because this is not something that you do because it's imposed or because someone is going to give you points. 
You do this because you want to give yourself some time to reflect and to think about your teaching. And so this is a gift that you're giving to yourself this afternoon. So I want to thank you for that um, moment that you're giving yourself. And I hope to contribute in some way to a reflection on some ideas that you might sleep on during these holidays and then bring all powered, uh, powered up for your next year. So, well, um, it's been a couple of years talking about the pandemic. And so, well, why not continue in that conversation today by talking about boosting our post-pandemic English teaching, right? So, well, let's move on. Um, let me see if I can move this slide. So, well, as it was presented on the video today, we want to um, help you make that decision or help you help us <laughs> uh, make people come to our master's program. We want to contribute to our country's development of English language learning. And the best way to do this is to continue educating ourselves, to continue reflecting on the matters that happen in the classroom and hopefully be ready for whatever comes up next. We don't know, uh, 2020, 2021 have taught us that our life can change in the blink of an eye. And as teachers, we are the ones stepping up and making the big changes. That's what we did. And we kept uh, our students afloat. We kept our families afloat. And so, well, this is uh, once again, kind of an invitation for us to reflect on what we could do to continue uh, improving our teaching situation. So. We're going to begin by hearing from you, okay? I would launch a Mentimeter um, because this is kind of a webinar slash workshop. So I'm going to ask you to contribute here. So if you have a QR code reader on your phone, you can read that QR code. Uh, if not, don't worry, I'll be sending the link in a second in the chat box. But I want you to be reflecting on the question while the link comes in. So the question is, how would you describe your students' motivation coming back from the pandemic? In five words, we're gonna have the word cloud in Menti. So I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute. All right, so that I can send you the link. So there you go. Please click on the link that is in the chat box and I'm going to open the mentee for us to see. So let me see, just in case somebody missed it, here it is. If anyone is on their phone, maybe taking a look at the webinar or, or the recording on their phone, you can write uh, on the chat box. However, we might not see all of your responses. The mentee might be a better way uh, to see you. However, um, if you want to write on the chat, it's still fine. We have some answers coming through. Thank you so much. We have uncertain. Complex, difficult, fragile, up, down, not good, non-focused, complex, lazy, uh, aggressive, sad, strange. I love these words. Challenging, unmotivated, difficult, friendless, tired, sad, bored, aggressive. Yeah, and I think we, um, sad but true, we catch we can extrapolate all these words to us as well, right? And we can add a big burned out for teachers, right? So is that we have some more words coming through, distracted, aggressive, mental issues, non-existing. <laughs> this is description of motivation, non-existing. That's wonderful. I mean, not that it's wonderful, it's just that it's so true. All right. Not good. Hyper connected. Oh my goodness. Thank you for that one. All right. Lazy, uncertain, lost. Okay. We have something coming through the chat. We have depressed, bored, difficult, right? Great. Thank you, Karen, for sharing. We have lazy as well, right? Okay. We have 11 people on the Mentimeter and 18 people. So I guess we are, um, we're on a, on a good roll there. Um, absolutely. Unfortunately, 
this is not one of those nice clouds where we just have positive words. Uh, definitely the pandemic, all those two years at home, being in front of a computer, having just your name showing up on the screen, um, having your phone next to you, made that our students came back to us in a very bad shape in terms of motivation, in terms of interest, in terms of um, eagerness to learn, right? So it's, it's all this, it's, it's lost, it's uncertain, it's difficult. And so for us, this presents challenges because um, it's not like we're more <laughs> apt than them at this point. We're tired, we're burnt out. So it was really hard um, to continue working with them. So I would like to present some quotes at the beginning um, just to um, make sure we kind of all put ourselves on the same page as to what we're going to be discussing today. So my personal experience is that 99% of language learners who really want to learn a foreign language, uh, i.e. who are really motivated, will be able to master reasonable working knowledge of it as a minimum regardless of their language aptitude. And so who said this? This was all Tan Dornier. And in 2020, in 2001, you know, that was a long time ago, right? But still, um, Zoltan Dornier is an expert in motivation for language learners. And he talks about students really being motivated and wanting to learn the language to be able to see an improvement. And then we go back to those words we just shared and definitely it doesn't say anyway, anywhere that they actually want to learn, right? It doesn't say anywhere that they are motivated that they um, are inclined towards uh, working, towards doing extra stuff. So it's like there is this dissonance in what we um, are expecting and what is happening. I love Zoltan Dornier too, Yanita. Absolutely. We share that love. Yeah. So talking about learning being fun, um, I was checking out some articles about what happens during the pandemic, what teachers were saying about their students' motivation, and then Andrew Bold in an article in 2021, he shares that it is important for teachers to think about how students are doing, not only academically, but also emotionally, and to find ways to inject joy into their lesson. So um, I remember, well, you know, when, when Jenny, that was <laughs> saying my profile, she said, um, like, maestría en educación amorosa, you know, because that's what it sounds like when you talk about Positive education, people imagine that you become kind of a unicorn and the rainbows start coming out of your mouth. That's what happens. Don't worry. Don't feel embarrassed. That's perfect that it actually happened like that because that's what it's kind of seen because now when we hear these words, of course, we all think about Instagram and toxic positivity, right? And it's, it's impossible not to think about it. However, it doesn't have to do anything with that. It has to do with being aware of our students as emotional beings or being aware of ourselves as emotional beings. And so I got into the whole positive education hype because of, um, honestly, it was because of one student who was suffering depression and he called me to say goodbye because he was intending to kill himself. So I, I was so out of resources. I was so scared that that was going to happen to me that I decided to study something so that I knew how to cope with these kinds of situations. And I couldn't have done it in a better time because it was in 2020. And of course, the pandemic hit. So I had to do all this resilience building and helping my students and helping my colleagues embrace technology and all the things, you know, that happened. And so, um, Absolutely, I couldn't agree more with Andrew Ball in regards to not only academics, but also emotions. And the thing is, the pandemic taught us we could not just, you know, um, not pay attention. We could not just pretend that anything was happening. It was so big and so noticeable that we couldn't teach a class. So we had to stop. We had to stop. We had to ask our students, how are you doing? How is your family? Uh, we learned how many people passed away during the pandemic. We heard about so many families losing members, so many kids losing their parents, so many even of uh, our colleagues and friends, you know, being taken away. So all this has taught us the importance of catering for students academically, yes, but also emotionally and also being aware of their emotional um, well-being, right? 
So one more, just continuing about these articles, you know, that I was searching. So Christina Hinton mentions, it is important for teachers to think about how students are doing not only academically, but also emotionally, and to find ways to inject joy into their lessons. There is a misconception that learning can either be rigorous or fun, right? Like either or. That's not what we're finding out in our research. The more they are flourishing and happy, the better on average students are doing academically. So I would like to connect these words with Zoltan Dornier, right? He talks about being motivated. But if you are not motivated, like for example, what happened to 11 graders or 10th graders, like pandemians, you know, these kids that had to do their 10th and 11th grade in the middle of the pandemic, they lost motivation for studying uh, higher education courses because they thought, what's the point? The world is going to end. I don't want to go into graphic design when I might die tomorrow, right? So it is. it was kind of a doomsday, of course, but do you remember what it was to be a teenager? Uh, of course, for them, this was much more, um, much darker and much bigger than it must have been for some of us. So definitely, if we want to motivate our students, we need to tender and care for their emotional well-being as well, right? So the last one from Andrew Ball, students are also more motivated when they, when they feel a sense of ownership over their work. And so these are some quotes that I would like us to think about throughout the whole thing, throughout the whole worship presentation, webinar slash everything, right? If students are enjoying what they're doing, if they are um, contributing, if they're making decisions, they're more likely to be more connected, right? So once again, I want to see some action on that mentee. Again, I'll move the slide in a second. The second question is, what strategies did you use to engage students during the return to face-to-face -face teaching? This year was a huge challenge because of that, precisely because uh, we didn't know how to get students again with us. So um, we want to know what you did, right? So I'm gonna share once again the screen, moving on to the next slide. I never know how to do this. You stop sharing your screen though. There we go, yeah. I, I, I am the tech lady and that happens, it's really embarrassing, okay. So there we go. What strategies did you use to engage students during their return to face-to-face -face teaching? Because the thing was this, some contexts had uh, a blend or hybridation of their teaching. So they were doing face-to-face -face and online. Other contexts just stayed online throughout the entire time. Other contexts, rural especially, had nothing. So they were doing WhatsApp lessons with worksheets and things. And then everybody, regardless of their conditions, regardless of their situations, have to go back to regular face-to-face -face teaching. So I'm interested in knowing what are the strategies that you use to engage learners when they came back all tired, lazy, unmotivated, aggressive, all the words you just mentioned in the previous question. Okay, somebody's telling us provide real information, context information. Okay. Yeah, like addressing the elephant in the room, just talking about it, you know, just talking about what was happening, I think was important. Thank you for the one just writing. So went to basics and tried to create a nice rapport and synergy with students, made them aware that I was also affected by the horrible pandemic. Thank you so much. I love that you use the word went to basics, you'll see why. <laughs> Cooperative learning, group work, absolutely getting them back to interact with one another. This isolation and this excessive use of social media definitely made our students um, feel stranded. So it was really hard to get them back. Okay, good. They designed their own rubrics to be evaluated. Very interesting, fantastic. So. I tried to combine some of the tools I had used during the pandemic with activities that made them participate and give their opinions about what we were doing. Fantastic, thank you. I did a lot of interaction activities so they could talk about who they are and how they feel. I asked them every day how they were promoting a good classroom environment. Awesome, just going back to the person, okay. 
We have making them move so they get involved with others. Great. I used and apply role play activities to engage students. Awesome. I tried to use more digital resources, but in the face-to-face -face environment. Okay, capitalizing all that learning that you did during the pandemic. Also activities that included a lot of group work as interaction is needed, absolutely. Okay, we have eight. The rest are a little shy, nothing on the chat yet. So remember, you can do it on the chat box or on the menti. We have one more. I tried to discover what they like, what music they usually listen to. We talked about movies and series. We created posters about holidays and cooking activities. Wonderful, it seems great. Everything seems so active, so hands-on, absolutely. I, I love and you'll see why I celebrate some of these comments <laughs> during the presentation, during the talk. Okay, great. Okay, thank you so much to those participating. Uh, I'm gonna move on to this. Once again, okay. Oh, there we have something on the chat box. I tried to explore their interests and departed from there. Good, very wise, very wise. Okay, so look to that person who wrote, I went back to basics. That's actually my recommendation, right? That's my suggestion here. Um, we need to go back to basics. So, okay, John says, I heard more to my students sometimes perhaps because all the time in the classes, we tend to ignore students' voices. Okay, great. Thank you for sharing that. I, you, you'll see why I'm celebrating some of the comments, especially. So, absolutely. I think I, I also think, as you mentioned, we need to go back to basics, and that starts not only with basics in language learning, but basics in psychology. Um, I, I bet some of you, most of you, might be familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you're not, you can just Google, um, you will find thousands of explanations. I'm just gonna have a brief one right here. Um, and it is, it's very simple. You might see even some memes that say, we need to Maslow before Bloom, right? The thing is, Maslow's hierarchy of needs talks about the different needs that a human being has. The basic ones um, are these basic two, two basic needs that are biological and physiological and safety. We know food, sleep, and water. We know students who haven't slept well, who haven't eaten in days, they are not gonna learn, right? So we need to satisfy this need first. Then we go for safety, security, health, finances. And we know that the pandemic caused that this specific needs were not covered for every family. So um, there were parents who lost their jobs. There were um, people who were not feeling um, safe. Uh, to be outside, to wear the mask, to be around other people. So we kind of had all this fear, you know, all this anxiety became part of who we are. And so going back to face-to-face -face teaching was bringing a lot of this um, anxiety to families as well. So is my, my kid going to get grandma sick, you know, all these all these things, because these needs are not met. Also financially, many families lost their jobs. And so of course, um, this also created stress. So we say, okay, let's say that we have these needs, these needs covered, right? So then we, we go to the psychological needs, love and belonging. So friendship, intimacy, family connections, we lost connections. We lost the relationship with our friends, teenagers. They are in that crucial moment of building their identity of not wanting to be with their parents uh, and just wanting to be with their friends and they were stuck with their parents for two years, generating a whole lot of problems. And so, of course, they come back to school and they are unregulated. They are completely collapsed. They have no idea how to interact with others. Um, and they are, I don't know, I'm sorry, I cannot find the word in, in English, but they are desbocados. <laughs> you know, that's what a student said. She, she is actually from Cali. She said, no, están desbocados, profe. Like, I, I don't know what to do. Like, I plan my classes and it's just absolute chaos just because they are so overwhelmed with having been isolated for so long. Then we have this theme uh, needs, respect, status, recognition, strength, self-esteem. How many students? I had a student, I, I don't work with, uh, with kids. I work with young adults in university. And I had a student who never turned on her camera. And she told me, um, teacher, I'm sorry, I just cannot turn on my camera because I hate to see myself. 
and that's like having a mirror the two hours of class. So I'm sorry, I'm not gonna turn it on. And so that kind of thing, you know, built all these terrible feelings in students about having to let people inside of their houses through the camera, so many things. You can just, I mean, think about your cases. And then after all these four are met, we have self-actualization, right? Meeting one's full potential in life, different for every person. So here is where learning comes, right? <laughs> learning comes at the top of this pyramid. And if I'm feeling that all the four needs below that are not being met, I'm not gonna be able to learn anything. So I, I'm not saying this to justify students' behaviors, but to understand it and to understand why we're feeling the way we're feeling. Which are the needs that you don't feel are being met for you in your institution? Which are the needs you don't feel are being met for you at home? And so this is going to definitely um, create a lot of feelings of burnout, overwhelm, and these sensations that we are tired, we don't wanna do anymore, right? So understanding this might not fix the problem, but it might help us have some peace of mind and understanding that we are going through something and we can just get out of it, okay? Great, so we're gonna continue here with once again going to my friend, our friend Dornier, right? So he, in 2001, 2001, he talked about this wonderful book um, that is Motivational Strategy in the Language Classroom. And I want to go back to basics here. This is a basic material for any teacher. And if you guys have not um, read the book, it's because you haven't taken Diana's course in the master's program. <laughs> so creating the basic motivational conditions is the first part. Then he says we need to generate initial motivation. Then we need to maintain and protect that motivation. And then we need to encourage positive self-evaluation, right? So after we have understood this whole idea of our students' needs, uh, we need to create the basic motivational conditions, yeah? And I'm sorry if what I'm gonna sound, if I'm, what I'm gonna say sounds rude, but as teachers, we cannot be so arrogant and just expect that our students love to learn in our class because it is in their schedule, right? We have to create the motivational conditions for them to want to be there, for them to want to learn with us. I know my students at the master's program, they have registered and they have to be in my class from 6 to 10 p.m. But I need to build the conditions for them to enjoy those four hours there and not to die, you know, by the end of the fourth hour thinking, oh my God, finally this is over. No, I want them to be motivated to learn, to get the new knowledge, to get the new ideas, to discuss. And how do I do this? By following Dornier's ideas and others that I'm going to share with you today. Right. So in his uh, in his book, I'm not getting anything from Cambridge University Press for saying this. Um, this is just a great material that I use. Diana uses, you know, like we, we all um, can benefit deeply from having this at hand. So, for example, I'm going to read a couple of the strategies in each one of the, of the sections for you to kind of get an idea of why I'm connecting this to what I'm going to be talking about today. So um, the first one says, demonstrate and talk about your own enthusiasm for the course material and how it affects you personally, right? So if we start our class with, okay, this course, I don't like this book, but anyway, I have to teach it, right? So I'm sorry, but I know we're not gonna do the best thing, but okay, we're gonna try. So um, I hope you like the class. I don't think that's gonna, you know, convey a lot of enthusiasm to students. And definitely we know that enthusiasm is contagious and we know that teachers, we are actors. And sometimes we don't feel like doing the class. We don't feel like teaching, but we gotta do it. And we put our face and we change our attitude and we tell our students, I want to be here and I want to be with you. And that is definitely what changes the situation. So that's the first strategy in the first um, set of strategies that he has. Another one is, the second one is take students learning very seriously, right? So yes, it's English class, but how can I make it better and more serious for them so that it's actually about their lives? You were saying it. You created interaction activities for students to communicate with each other. You created exercises where they could collaborate. 
So you're taking the learning seriously, right? By planning your classes. And the third one, for example, is develop a personal relationship with your students. Guys, this is 2001. This is way before the pandemic. This is way before positive education, right? So this is some basic elements that we need to consider as teachers. If I want to develop a personal relationship with my students, it doesn't mean that I'm gonna be their best buddy, I'm gonna drink beer with them. It does not mean that. It means that I care for my students, that I know what's going on and that I try to cater for their needs. And so those of you who said that you were interested in your students' interests to start from there, that's exactly what this strategy talks about. So definitely, I encourage you to go through the whole checklist. It's wonderful. It has a lot of material there. And in the book, he has it like, you know, um, the, the strategy and he has two columns, okay, right here. Like I tried it out or it's already part of my teaching. So talking about the generating initial motivation, the second one, um, he has, for example, raise the learner's intrinsic interest in the L2 learning process. How can I do this? If all my students wanna talk about is their emotions, I include my emotions in the teaching of my class, right? I include vocabulary to express emotions. There we go. We are combining, we are, um, I, I, don't, I don't know how to replace the violent analogy of <laughs> uh, killing two birds with a stone, uh, but yeah, well, actually I do that, right? I try to build the interest in something that is personal to them, but it's also part of my class, right? Mm -hmm. And another strategy in that section is um, promote the student's awareness of the instrumental values associated with the knowledge of an L2. So, okay, what is it, what, why is it good for me, right? In this world where we are now, why is English good for me? So we can help them build that idea, that identity as English users. Okay, then we move on to the next category, which is maintaining and protecting motivation. There, we can have make learning more stimulating and enjoyable by breaking the monotony of classroom events. So if we always have the same routine in class, breaking that is going to help us. And hopefully some of the ideas that I'm gonna to share today will give you some tools for that. Um, present and administer tasks in a motivating way, right? How can I do that? Explaining the purpose, the utility of a task, not just, I mean, this, any of this means you gotta become a clown. Don't worry about it. Nobody's saying that. It's just saying we need to make our enthusiasm for our course contagious. And if you don't like your class, well, make yourself like it, right? Find the ways, find the ways in which you can make it better for you so that you can make it better for them, right? Okay, once again, we're going to move on to the third, maintaining and protecting motivation. Oh, we did that already, right? Or the fourth, encouraging positive self-evaluation. So um, provide students with positive information feedback. So constantly giving feedback to students. I know it's not easy. I suck at it. It's really hard to give constant positive motivation, but it's so important for them, right? Offer rewards in a motivational manner, right? So there are many psychologists that talk about what well, talk against uh, rewards. So we're not talking about gold stars that build differences in our classroom. We're building other types of motivators for them, right? Okay, so we are going to connect this to some of the lessons that we learned. Oh, well, I, I at least I learned during the pandemic, right? So the first one was mental health and cell are important, okay? Who learned this lesson? Write me in the chat if it was one of the lessons that you learned. Thank you, Andres, learned that lesson. Okay, Yanita, Santiago, all right. So mental health and social emotional learning became way more important than the content. So uh, we started classes by asking how people were because we knew that they were going through very difficult things. Uh, we were too. And so this became something like a topic of conversation, right? It became a topic for some units, for some classes. Look, everybody's coming through with me, 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 right? Okay, great. Second lesson, you can write me. Learning needs to be active and intentional. 
So before the pandemic, we would used to cram a lot of topics and, you know, like the scope and sequence of the book and just run with it. But then the pandemic taught us you got to be intentional. You cannot do it all. You have to choose. What is it that you're going to be doing? Because you need evidence. You need to collect evidence from your students that things are happening because anyone is opening their cameras. So how are we going to know that students are actually learning well by being intentional and active, right? Generating activities that helped us see where students were and how they were doing. And lesson number three, technology is a means to an end, right? We learned that uh, we used a lot of things, but we learned that, that was not the most important. Oh God, wait, <laughs> I didn't want to show you my cat yet. Okay, two and three, two and three. All right, those were like three of the biggest lessons that I learned and that I can connect to today's, um, today's idea or topic, right? So on the chat box, please write, how can we use our English class as a space to strengthen our student post-pandemic lives? What do you think? What have you done? These are things that you might already be working on, some projects you might have already put in place at your institutions because of the need to support your students. Um, so how can we do it? How have you done it? I, I would love to hear anyone who would like to open up the microphone while the others write on the chat box. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Well, the thing is, I, I, I always like participating. Um, but I was thinking that the good thing about teaching English is that you can talk about any topic as long as you use English. Exactly. And therefore, it is a very good opportunity to talk about their feelings, their situations, their fears, their whatever. Um, discuss, analyze, be critical, read, talk to each other, have speed dating sessions. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So as long as they do it in English, you can even write a project. Like you can have like project-based teaching and, and yeah. So Andres tells us making it it's just making it a safe space to create new relationships. That's great. Claudia okay. says she doesn't understand the question. So how can you make our class? I mean, talking about the lessons that we have learned, Claudia. How can you make your English class a space to protect your students, to strengthen their skills, to help them recover that uh, willingness to learn, you know, that idea that we had before, but now it's kind of gone. Um, I think we can relate the content to the new context and talk about anything as long as you do it in English, yeah. All right, okay. So John Brainer, you wanna go ahead and open up the microphone? Yes, uh, I, I try to, sometimes I, if I have the possibility because of the topic or because of the time uh, of the class, I used, uh, I used to look for some materials and maybe some tests or some videos related to interest, to interesting aspects or maybe to topics that may, uh, could re, could be related to the what to what we lived you know, during the pandemic, for uh -huh. example, uh, uh, once uh, I chose a reading for English five, I, why I quit the company, uh, but I, I consider that reading was uh, kind of uh, appropriate because of the first for the level, and second because of the uh, for the context we, we were living or during uh, the pandemic. And I took advantage uh, for talking about how important it is to, to, feel, to feel calm, to feel uh, somehow happy in, in spite of uh, what we were living, what we were coping uh, during this situation. And I used to do that, those, those activities or those, those type of activities. I tried to, to make English become a pretext for a, uh, teaching some issues or some aspects more the, more related to English about uh, related to life. Mm -hmm. of, also, uh, of course, I, I use English. I, I don't know if may, uh, it could be the, 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 the word, but kind of clear. I use some psychology topics or some other issues or some other aspects in English to, to have the possibility to let the students express 
some feel free and feel, feel uh, motivated to to continue learning because right now it's very difficult for them or during that that time was very difficult for them to to feel learning was good or was interesting because okay. we were thinking on other issues yeah yeah absolutely you were not i mean your mind what we're going back to maslow's uh, pyramid right we were trying to get other needs satisfied first we were not feeling safe we were feeling overwhelmed scared and so it was very hard to focus on, on class and on understanding the topics and et cetera. All right, so Danny says, we can include the students doing reality activities in order to interact with each other. Okay, of course, wonderful. All of those ideas you place there are fantastic. So I would like to connect my three things, my loves here, you know, uh, as Diana says, I'm the tech lady, but also I have this uh, fear, this love for, um flip learning that's another thing and the positive education thing right so it's it's the whole thing. i did mention the three of them you did you did mention them and i want to combine them because for me those three are just natural together so i i wanted to make this this next part called well-being and language learning combined right like the whole the, the whole thing we can put it together it doesn't have to be one or the other so my invitation here is that as you listen to the tips in the following section, please two things. One, take notes on how you would apply them in your context, okay? Like you might say, I would do this. I like that idea. I didn't like this. You just take notes, okay? And also I need you to vote for the techniques from one to five, one being the least suitable for your context and five being the most suitable for your context, okay? So you are actually going to need something to take notes on, even if it's your phone, a paper, a pen, something, so that as I'm talking, you are reflecting on your context and taking some notes on, okay, I would do this, or no, this doesn't apply to me, okay? Are you all ready? I see that Diana stood up for some paper, which I love, <laughs> okay. Hello. All right, she got the notebook of the best teacher. All right, <laughs> great. Uh, yeah, good thing you are in Kalina in though, Bogota. It even to me. Yeah, good thing you are in Kalina in Bogota, so we both can be the best teacher there is. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, so let's get on with this. So some tips to boost our students' post-pandemic motivation. Okay, this is the whole thing. First thing, begin class with students' cell in mind. Let's remember cell social emotional learning, right? The second one is going to be use web tools granularly to strengthen student engagement. And I'll get to the granularly in a moment. Include cooperative collaborative learning activities. Definitely you all mentioned, some of you mentioned you actually did this. So that's great. Include different means of expression and representation. So I'll talk about something there. And five, differentiate instruction, okay? I also, um, Diana did mention the book. My book, it's a student-centered approach to differentiated learning. So like the whole thing is about differentiating instruction for students. Um, put so it back so I can take a picture. Oh, put it, put it back. Okay. Pere, 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 pere. <laughs> I want to take a picture of uh, what I want to do. And I have her in the center. Wait. There <laughs> I go. Wait, wait, wait. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I, I was so I was so shameless that I put it in my in my canvas profile. You know, there's a link to it, just in case for those of you who have the professors there. Got it? Ah, okay. Yeah, I put it there. And so I have another bonus for you. Listen to your students. I guess a couple of you also mentioned that in the Mentimeter. So let's get on. The first tip is to begin class with cell in mind. So if we think about cell, social emotional learning, there are different frameworks. One of them is the framework of the masters that I did that is positive education. And so that is more on the lines of positive psychology, the American Psychological Association. Um, Martin Seligman, you're gonna hear um, these names of these people. So we have Martin Seligman talking about um, 
learned helplessness, but also positive psychology. We have Angela Duckworth talking about grit. We have some other people, um, Mihal Chitzel Mihail talking about flow and different words and, and things that can connect us to how to make this better from a positive education perspective. However, CASO, an American association, it's, it's the, I don't remember the SME, the Consortium for American Social Emotional Learning or something like that, right? So they came up with a model for schools, for education. So this is social emotional learning for school. And so this model has five different aspects that are um, in orange, the self, self-awareness and self-management. In green, we have the, the ones that are kind of um, for others, like me, including others, like social awareness and relationship skills. And then the yellow one is for everything, which is responsible decision making. So the idea is that here, everybody, as you can see in the image, classroom, schools, families, caregivers, and communities contribute to this model, helping students, kids, children, um, develop these skills from a very young age. Of course, this sounds wonderful, but this is once again an American model, um, <laughs> yeah, that they, they can do and they implement wherever they want. The thing is, we are, I mean, we're not gonna learn throughout the whole model. You can, the website is amazing. It has a lot of free resources. It has lesson plans, it has research, it has articles, it has many things, just caseol.org. Uh, it's a fantastic website, but I would like us to kind of think about just four points, right? Things that we normally do in our lives that we can connect to the social emotional learning in mind, right? So the first thing is visible thinking routines. The second one is our typical warm-up activities in class. The third is cell check-ins. And the fourth is mindfulness reading or meditation, okay? So I'm going to get there with the visible thinking routine. And for this, I'm gonna need my notes because I, I did take notes at first. <laughs> so the visible thinking routines, I don't know if you are familiar with Project Zero from Harvard. This is another fantastic website. Actually, I have it linked somewhere. Uh, yes, <laughs> uh, I wanted to give you this website because it's just fabulous, right? Sorry, I'm gonna continue back on my slideshow. Um, doo -doo -doo. <clears throat> so Project Zero is, um, it's a fantastic website created by Harvard for Education, and they have lists and lists and lists of thinking routines, right? The idea is, as, a, as, it, as it, the word says, it's a routine, so we shouldn't do all of them, you know, at once. We should just stick to a few and do them repeatedly to get the students to actually use them well, right? So in this idea of the visible thinking routines, we would be putting in practice, and I'm gonna go back to the model. We're gonna be putting on, in practice self-management with setting personal goals, using planning and organizational skills. We would be also tackling um, self-awareness by linking feelings and values and thoughts and examining prejudices and biases, for example, that are some other routines that can help us do that. And social awareness as well, by taking others' perspectives, right? So if we do a simple visible thinking routine, we can be doing all of that development of the social emotional learning model, right? So for example, one that I, I, I chose, one that I know is very popular in school, that is see, think, wonder, right? So we have a new topic and we ask our students, what do you see? What do you think about that? What does it make you wonder, right? Any topic, we can do this with anything, a grammar structure, a vocabulary set, a listening strategy, even a social studies clear class, whatever it is that you do, you can use this thinking routine to develop your students' social emotional learning through the different organizational skills and executive function, right? Another one is our warm up activities. So instead of having activities that uh, warm up activities that are simply like answer a question or something, we can connect our warm up activities to either the visible thinking routines I just talked about or the ones that I'm going to talk about next, right? So we can replace our typically 
let's say language oriented games to something more cell uh, oriented, right? I, I think it's an important activity to have. Um, and I guess in every program or every teacher education program, you're gonna hear about warm up activities because of a very simple reason. Students come to our English class and they're not thinking in English, right? They're thinking in social studies, they're thinking in chemistry, they're thinking in hormones, whatever it is. So um, we need to set up the mood. And so the warm up activity helps us do that. But instead of having a generic one, we can connect it to our social emotional learning. So cell check-ins, right? That is the, the next one that I want to invite you to do. So the question is simple and easy. How are you feeling? However, there are studies by Susan David, by Mark Brackhead, by Brené Brown, many, many psychologists that mention that we don't have a vocabulary to talk about our emotions. So normally when we say, how are you feeling? The answer is, I'm fine, thanks. And when the answer is not that, when the answer is something more realistic, like I'm feeling like crap, I'm terrible, I'm super sad and depressed, people don't know what to do with that, right? People are like, uh, um, okay, I wish you had answered, fine, thank you, right? So this takes us some building. It takes us some culture building in our class. So for that, I would like to share with you this instrument, which is called a mood meter. Uh, this is part of Dr. Mark Brackett's um, research at the Yale Center for, oh my God, I forgot this, the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. And this chart, you can Google it and you can find the chart. It has a hundred words to express emotion, right? You can use this as a tool throughout the entire academic year, right? You can teach your students the words, you can have them search for the words, you can have them use a dictionary in class. Okay, so let's see who is more in the yellow quadrant. Okay, you all, you all get together. Who is more in the red quadrant? You all get together. Who feels more in the blue quadrant? You all get together. And now let's try to search for the words. Why are you feeling that way, right? So we're doing an excellent vocabulary exercise because wouldn't it be great if we all had a hundred words to express our emotions instead of saying, eh, meh, you know, meh is not an emotion, it's not there, <laughs> but we say it, right? Um, yeah, and there is one word in Spanish, which is a pretty bad word. I don't know if I can say it in the webinar, but that's another that is not an emotion, right? <laughs> you all know what I'm talking about, right? It, 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 it's a two word, it's a compound, and it finishes with existential. And the first part, the first word starts with M, okay? And so that is not an emotion, um, sorry to tell you. <laughs> so this is a great exercise. It can take us a, take us a bimester, a semester, a year, you know, like depending on the class, depending on our students. We can practice spelling, we can practice pronunciation, we can practice vocabulary. I mean, there are, the possibilities are endless. And we will be helping our students regulating their emotions because the first part or the first condition to regulate your emotions is to be able to name them, to label them. If we don't know what they are, it's going to be really hard for us to, to really, um, you know, say and, and regulate that emotion. Okay, great. I'm checking, I'm checking the, I'm, great, thank you. I'm checking the chat. So yes, absolutely. We're all the time kind of expecting this rehearsed uh, response. And today, um, absolutely, it's it's not gonna work that way. The fine, thank you, and you. Um, yeah, John Brainer, this I just you just Google the mood meter, okay? Mood meter, just Google it, and you'll find it. It's there are many different possibilities of image. You know, like I, I the possibilities are endless. I just Think about it. Imagine having like a poster in your classroom where each one of these is a card. And on the back of the card, you have the meaning and an example. Of what do I feel that way? You know, you can have your student draw it. It's, it's a wonderful tool, definitely. Okay, great. All right. And the fourth one is mindfulness breathing meditations, right? The here and the now. So this is one of the greatest um, things we could do for our students especially because of what you mentioned somebody put it in the in the word wall in the world in the the cloud you said hyper connected right 
students are in class with their cameras off, but they are like this, right? They're on their phone all the time. They're not paying attention. And then they say, que lo virtual no sirve, because they haven't been connected. They are connected to their phones, to WhatsApp, to Instagram, to TikTok, to whatever it is they're connected. And they are not really part of the class. They are not being there and in the moment, right? So by inserting in some mindfulness breathing meditations in our class, we can teach them to be here and now. And this is not, you know, this is not religious. This is not a religious thing at all. This is learning how to breathe, learning how to use your lungs, learning that if you breathe three times deeply, counting up to four and then inhaling and exhaling up to four, you're going to uh, stimulate the vague nerve, making you more relaxed and more prone to learning. I mean, there is research behind this. This is not some spiritual juju thing, you know, this is actually something that has been researched on the benefits of mindfulness for learning, for reducing anxiety when facing exams, when reducing anxiety, when talking to your boss, if your boss is not Diana, because Diana, you don't feel anxiety talking to her, you know. <laughs> so that kind of, of research tells us that our students need this and we can turn it into an English learning exercise. How? Using websites or pages like, um, I forgot the name, Go Noodle. <laughs> yeah, this is a screenshot of a video on YouTube. Um, I don't have the link, I'm sorry, eh, because the time is short. But anyway, I, I challenge you, please go, go to uh, YouTube and check Go Noodle Mindfulness, right? Just write it down. You're going to find great meditations for kids. And this, I, I use it with my students in class. And my students in class are not kids. They're teachers like you, right? And we enjoy it. It's about shaking off bad emotions. It's about connecting with yourself. It's about connecting with the moment. And we can teach vocabulary to our students. For example, this melting one is one of my favorite. And it says that we have to melt, like we have to tight our muscles and then let them go easy. And so students listen to the word arms, fingers, shoulders, your head, you know, so whenever you are checking that topic, you can do this and connect it to your students' well-being, right? So let's remember that quote at the beginning. It's, it is important for teachers to think about how students are doing not only academically, but also emotionally, and to find ways to inject joy into their lesson. Okay. Thank you, Yanita. There you go. Go Noodle, it's a website, it's fantastic. It not only has meditation, it also has exercise. So like if you want to activate your students, you can also do it. But I, I in this one, I'm talking about the, the relaxing, but you can do the whole thing, activating, relaxing, you know, mix it up. If you have a TV in your class or if you can use your phone to just play it, that would be awesome. Okay, so we went through the first, be, begin class with self, with students cell in mind. We're gonna go to the second one, which is use web, to, web tools granularly to strengthen students' engagement, right? So they have to go fast. And so how does that work? During the pandemic, we went crazy, right? We were doing quizzes, we were doing Socrates and Nearpod and WhatsApp and Padlet and Pear Deck and Mentimeter and Paul Everywhere and GeekKit. And Flipgrid and Flippity and Google and YouTube and Kahoot all in the same class, right? So everyone was going nuts. I, yeah, I learned to use Kahoot and the students were like, no more Kahoot, please, right? So now, because it was so much of this during two years, students don't want to know anything about it. And you say, okay, we're going to do this Kahoot. Oh, you guys. You know, like that once again, it, it, this was our motivation back in the day. Not anymore, because they don't want to know anything about it, right? So that is the point of the word granularly, right? We have to select what we want to use and why. Um, yeah, <laughs> we were going crazy like this ostrich right here. But now that we know about breathing, we can just breathe and select, right? So we need to make conscious choices based on students and your own savviness and on availability, right? So if you know that your context doesn't have a projector, doesn't have the tools, doesn't have tablets, doesn't have phones, 
Well, you don't use that, you print, right? I, I tell my students, because there's always, I mean, you have no idea what it is to teach a class on technology but with people who have no technology in their institutions. And I say, well, that's the magic of teachers. We do what we can with what we have. If all you have is your phone, fabulous. You can use clickers. You print out the QR codes and you scan the codes and your students are participating using technology. But if you have a projector, you use it to show a video of Go Noodle. But if you have a computer in your classroom, you can do some more, right? So the idea is to make conscious choices based on students and your own savviness and availability. How do you feel about it? Do you feel that technology is going to make you more stressed? Do you feel that is going to add to your mental conundrum? Don't do it, you know, don't use it. And that's the thing. We learned because we did it for two years that we can do anything. So now we can choose consciously what it is that we want to use, okay? So I have one more gift for you. This one I do have. Uh, this is a periodic table of fancy stuff, you know, just in case you want to use some apps. Um, here in the chat box, you can see it. It tells you like if you hover over the different boxes, you are going to see what it does, right? What each one of the websites does. So for example, you know Miro, so it does this. Uh, you know, for example, this podcast, slide share quizzes, what does it do? Slack, what is it for, right? So you can just use this tool to learn about different um, web tools and decide which one is best for your own context and your own teaching situation, all right? Another tip within is to mimic tech use with analog resources, right? If you did something, I mean, we did that reverse. Like we were doing some activities and then we transformed them into live worksheets, right? To, meet, to turn them into digital resources. Now we have to go backwards. Now, whatever we did digitally, we have to be able to do um, analogly. So for example, this, you can do this on the board. <laughs> I did it on Jamboard, right? And so whatever my students, can do on the board, they can do on Jamboard, and it all depends on the availability and the savviness of my students and myself, right? So this is the thing about the second tip, is just being very conscious of your context. So remember, you're taking notes and you are voting. We already have two techniques, two tips that we have gone through. Let's move on to the third. The third one is include cooperative and collaborative learning activities, right? And the, for this one, um, I love this one. I love Kagan's structures. Danita knows this. <laughs> I went to it back in, I don't know when, like 2018 or something. That was a long time ago. And we did some Kagan structure activities. This is a model that was born in the 80s. You know, these guys, Kagan, they uh, came up with some structures for cooperative learning. And they have a whole bunch. You can recognize some on the slide. Corners, uh, we have Think for Share, we have Circles, Riley Robin. These are some familiar names. Once again, if you are not familiar with them, you just Google them. Kagan Structures. I'm giving you like the Googleable word so that you can search and go for it if you like it. In here, the idea is to have students cooperate, right? So for example, this one is my, my digital version of the four corners, which I love. The physical one is just, you know, agree, strongly agree, disagree, and strongly disagree are papers that you paste on the physical corners of the classroom. But in my Jamboard version, all my students are connected on Zoom. I just create many Jamboard pages with this and I put the statement at the center with a post-it and then everyone just writes their name and they move it, you know, and then I create a breakout room with the different positions and they talk, right? So it all, I mean, anything you do face-to-face, -face, you can do digitally. If that's your teaching situation, we just have to kind of try to adapt. But in here, the important thing is not the digital or the, or the analog um, means, here, the important thing is to have students cooperate, to have students uh, think together and coming up with solutions, right? 
you guys, uh, school teachers are very familiar with the think pair share, right? It's very common to have, let's think about something, let's discuss it with a pair, let's share it all together. So this is a Kagan structure, right? So I, I just wanted to show you this because you might find them very familiar, right? Another one is uh, using the design thinking process. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the design thinking process. This has uh, five different steps that are empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. And these are, I mean, this is a process that is used for design, yeah, for creating uh, products, for designing commercials, for designing advertisements, whatever. But we can absolutely use it in the classroom, right? We can have our students empathize in this, in this part. We think about the potential customer, right? So let's imagine that you are, you can do this for certain units in class. And so you have them think about the person. So for example, we are gonna be creating a solution for the water problem in Choco, right? That is our class purpose today. And so first of all, we're gonna try to empathize with the people who live there and their needs. Why are they missing? What do I have in my house that they don't have? How can they, uh, how can I connect with the person for whom I'm creating a service, right? Then they will define what they would do and they will have to write that. Then they'll ideate. So for example, we would create um, like a rainfall collector system that, that goes inside the houses and blah. So they will have to draw it there. In the ideation part, we normally draw. And also we do that in the prototype. In our classes, I mean, because it's not design or architecture or anything like that, we wouldn't ask them to make a model, but we can ask them to draw something, right? And then we have testing. Testing that might be presenting it to my classmates, presenting it to another class, doing a Zoom call with an expert to see what they think about it, right? It's just, what I'm saying here is we need to have students collaborate and we can just extrapolate any strategy from any field into our English class, right? <coughs> Sorry. Okay, so we did those three. Now I have an idea for including different means of expression and representation, right? I don't know if you guys are familiar with UDL. UDL is Universal Design for Learning. Once again, this is born in architecture. Um, Think about the different um, accommodations that needed to be made for people in different buildings. So they started, I mean, before, I don't know how many years ago, people would build a building and they didn't have anything for people in wheelchairs, right? So they started uh, talking about this and saying how it wasn't inclusive, how people needed to have some way to go to access the building. And so they started creating ramps, right? And ramps became a big thing, but ramps were thought for the people in wheelchairs, but they benefited a lot of other people. They benefited people with baby carriages, right? So those people with the strollers could also benefit from the ramp, also could benefit people from, with the cane, like walking on a cane is more, it's easier in a ramp than it is in stairs. And so the thing is that in universal design for learning, we think about, we design education and we design our classes in a way that is inclusive for everybody. We don't just plan for the average student. Yeah, that doesn't exist anymore. I mean, we have to know that student variability is super high and that average student, what? <laughs> so um, Aaron Sams, one of, the, one of the flipped learning gurus, he says, we need to plan for the fringe. You know, like we're usually planning for the center and so we're leaving out a lot of people. But if we plan for the fringe, if we plan for the, for the border of the window, right? then we are including everyone. The fast learner, the slow learner, the learning, the learner with hard of hearing problems, the learner with some difficulties uh, seeing from afar, maybe not blind students, but students with, um, with short-sightedness, you know, that maybe don't have glasses because their parents haven't realized. Um, we are including everyone. And so part of this model, I definitely invite you to take a look at this. This connects beautifully with flipped learning, with English, with everything. Um, in this model, we have the need to provide multiple means for engagement, representation, and action and expression. So it is not enough with having one assignment option because not everybody will connect with that assignment. In my class, I have two assignment options. 
I know that might go <laughs> for some teachers that may, I mean, make them a little crazy, but I'm talking about all these things. I need to provide my students with choice, right? And so that's the thing. We try to optimize autonomy. We try to get students to really um, find ways to feel themselves, right? And so I'm going to just stick to two here, means of representation and expression. So how can we do this? Very easily, including art, music, drama, drawing, sketching, singing, composing, and other means of expression, right? So in your project, you can have students, instead of just write that essay, unless you're teaching a writing class, <laughs> yeah, you can have them represent things in different ways, yeah, through music, to drawing, through sketching, and you can actually include these strategies in your class, right? And so this would be, uh, you can check the box of uh, accommodating for students, you know, providing accessibility, which is a very fashionable word nowadays that inclusion is so hot and trendy. Uh, you can check that box if you do this, just because you are providing students with different means of representation and expression, okay? All right, and the last, last but not least, is differentiated instruction. Uh, but you mentioned it, I think Andres mentioned that, by keeping students' interests and preferences in mind, right? Um, so in my, in my little world, the way I do this is by offering choice in the presentation of content and in products. So for example, I present the content in my classes through different, these different things. Hyperdocs, choice boards, games, learning menus, and learning paths. So this is a hyperdoc. I want to share it with you. Um, this is a hyperdoc that I designed as a review of the present tenses. Um, and it has mindfulness in it. You know, like it's a, it's a combination of both topics and also a combination of uh, the other topic is character strengths, like how strong you are in different part, in different things. This is a positive psychology thing. I'm leaving it there to you. Just open the links. I know you're not going to have time today, but you may, you know, oh, that crazy lady talked about something called hyperdox. Let's see what's up, what, what's up with that, right? So that is the, the hyperdoc. I'm not going to check it now because it's like a thousand slides all. <laughs> like it's, it's very long. Um, the other one is choice board. So for example, to my student, I was teaching how to build the LinkedIn profile. That was a task in English for professional purposes class. And so here, the idea of a choice board is to offer options to students, right? So in here, you can see there are four different options. Each option has um, a different task. And so I think of different tasks and students decide what they're gonna work on, right? So I can say, well, you need to do, everybody needs to do task three, um, or you can choose a task that you wanna work with. Normally, for example, in this one, what I did was each one decided to work on two tasks, whichever they were, but there were video and text, ta text tasks. So they had to choose one and one, right? And then they will mingle and share what they found and search. Trust me, students feel way more motivated when they have even this very small amount of choice, right? Okay, so that's the second one that I'm sharing there with you. The third one is games, yeah? So I teach uh, or I taught this beautiful class of research methods too that nobody liked. And I was trying to make this review on APA style, the seventh edition, people hated this. I'm gonna give you the game because you actually need it because this is so bad. Like people get um, all worked up about this. And for example, here I'm, I'm, I'm sharing with you this website, which is called Genially. Genially has of course free and paid options. The free version of course offers some, some stuff with limitations, but this one is in the free version. So you can design this board game about anything and of course if you have um if you are doing only classroom classes you can do this um printing it up you know like print the board print the cards and just have students play in class okay so um the other one is by offering as you can see this is a very simple word document yeah it's very very simple offering a learning menu 
<clears throat> so like I tell my students, all right, so you're gonna choose two appetizers, minimum three main course activities, uh, one dessert, one bonus you can have if you want or not. And if you wanna do a personalized activity, you can do it, right? And so this is to practice English, for example, in this case. So write a journal, um, make copies of grammar and news, I'm promoting uh, piracy, I'm sorry, uh, find a person to write to in English, right? So very simple things, but the whole idea is for students to choose. And just by giving them this very small amount of choice, they become motivated right away. And you're also differentiating because you are providing people who want to watch TV the opportunity, people who want to listen to music, people who are more organized, people who are more um, structured and rigorous. You give everybody a chance to do what they want to do and what they feel more comfortable doing, right? And last but not least, in my infamous um, research methods course, um, I taught how to write the literature review. So I created this path. I'm giving you all of this, right? These are great resources for you doing the masters. And I'm sorry, I went to WhatsApp, I don't know why. Okay, uh, I wanted to go to this chat. Okay, there we go. So you have that one, you can absolutely use it. Hopefully it helps you, you know, in the process that you're actually working on right now. But this is also designed with Genially. And so this is called a learning path. When I do a learning path, I give students different steps to follow, right? Uh, but they can follow them in their own order, in their own time. So I would do this in a class, for example. Like in a class session, instead of me standing up to teach, I would give them this and students would go into the steps that they need to go. So if you see the page, um, for example, the first one says, what is the difference between the theoretical framework and the literature review? The second, the literature review section. The third, uh, searching for resources. And so there are things inside of this. So for example, this one says inception, a lesson inside a lesson. So I have another one teaching them how to search for academic sources, how to, and what I'm doing here is providing all of my students with choice and letting them work in their own pace, not having everybody at the same time like we're doing here, right? Okay, my goodness, I'm so aware of time that it's just driving me crazy. Yeah, <laughs> I just have the three minutes for my bonus. <laughs> and well, one minute for the bonus and two minutes to share your, your voting. I want to see the voting. So listen to your students. Some of you said um, that you actually collected students' ideas. So absolutely, that's, that's what this is about. Students are also more motivated when they feel a sense of ownership over their work. So when they propose things, when they are the ones coming up with the ideas, of course, they're more connected, right? So that is our bonus, Connect, collect feedback from them. I do all these activities and I ask my students constantly, like annoyingly constantly, what do you feel? How do you like it? Do you think we should change activity? What kind of activity do you like? You know, ask students to brainstorm activities. What would you like to do? Yeah, why not? We are so scared sometimes to lose control, but definitely this helps us have students being more engaged. They participated, they proposed the activity. So of course they are gonna want to do them, right? So do you want to learn more about these and other topics? Definitely register to our master's program. That's where you're gonna get all of this and more. Okay, so I want to read in the chat box some of those votings. Uh, which activities do you think you might do? Which things you already do? Which things are no, not suitable for your context? Um, I'll stop sharing so we can see who's there. And yeah, that was it. Yeah, so share and, and then we'll sign off because we gotta go make dinner, right, mommies? <laughs> so you didn't write anything during the whole thing? <laughs> I saw Diana, Diana was taking notes, yeah. I, I saw that because the camera was on. <laughs> Go ahead, Claudia, thank you. 
Um, well, I have to say that I absolutely loved the one that you uh, shared with us about uh, giving them options so that they can uh, choose what they want to do. The, that board that you the shared. The choice board, yes, yeah. wonderful. Yeah, I think it's wonderful and I love it because I, I think it's an excellent way to, uh, as you said, to get them involved and to make them participate and feel like this, uh, like get this sense of uh, uh, sense of belonging in, in, their, in the class. So okay. I, I really okay. like Thank that you, one. Thank wonderful. You, you know, you that much. one, I, I am not really good at design. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I didn't get the good results. <laughs> no. Uh, that one yeah, is... no. Did you see her genially? That's what she <laughs> pays for it, no? <laughs> no, no the, all, all of those are genius. templates. All of those are templates, trust me. So yeah. that one, but anyway, the they look board, awesome. is Light Mania. It's Light Mania, you just write choice board and they have a thousand options for you to choose and to create it. It's just adding the things, you know? So mm -hmm. if you want to take the plunge, go for it. It's Light Mania, we'll give you the templates, okay? Yeah, but I, I really appreciate that and, and that idea that you gave us because I had mm -hmm. uh, done something similar, but not in that way. And I think it's very practical and, and very useful. Thank okay. you. Okay, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Thank you, Claudia, for, for your intervention. Okay. <clears throat> okay, we have here uh, cooperative tasks would have to be number one, doing cell activities, although I don't actually plan with cell in mind, okay. Uh, also differentiated instruction, which will offer different means of expression or representation. Awesome, awesome. Okay, no problem, no problem, Martha, that's fine. I loved all of them, okay. <laughs> Okay. Yes, Andres, this is really important what you say. Students hesitate sometimes to learn from their kids, from their peers. Um, and this is something we need to start encouraging uh, and helping them do. Um, there is actually research by Professor Eric Mazur from the University of Harvard. He came up with a concept called peer instruction. Um, and it's because what he says is that um, we professors, we hit the, the curse of knowledge. You know, la maldición del conocimiento. So we know so much that we don't remember how we learned and how it was, how it felt not to know. You know, so like that, that idea of I, I know this and it's so clear to me that I don't know how to transmit it. So peer instruction comes to solve that problem. And well, in his model, his model is very specific, like very, you know, uh, it's very structured. He's a physics professor, uh, but basically it's student teaching student. And it's just answering a quiz, justifying your responses and, and seeing um, what you can contribute to your, to your peer. And so one way that I have succeeded in, in, in encouraging my students to do the peer correction is by offering clear and easy to use uh, assessment instruments so like a checklist or because normally I think rubrics might be too complicated for them to use with each other so a checklist normally will help and, and will do the trick for them to learn to do this because yeah they they are not prone to doing it just naturally right thank you thank you thank you for the recommendation okay great yeah and Eric Mazur he's awesome and he created a website uh, called Perusal. Oh, I totally, my students love it. <laughs> Perusal is a social learning website where you can add your readings and students will discuss, add questions and comments asynchronously or synchronously, right? So you can, and it's based on that theory of peer instruction. Got it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for staying, for, for your comment and everything. Okay, the most interesting about these tools is that they might be used for cross-curricular purposes while engaging the kids and fostering a good usage of tech. Absolutely. Thank you so much for pointing that out, uh, Teacher Gogo. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, we uh, with our book, we are English teachers, my co-author and me, but we never thought this just was for English teaching. You know, this is just generic. It's for anything we can combine our knowledges with the other professors, with the other teachers, and um, make this a whole educational experience, not only for language. Um, that's actually our mission, right? As English teachers who are bilingual to 
take all these theories that are so cool for language learning and take them down to our social studies, math, chemistry, and biology teachers who still continue with their same pedagogies, right? Yeah. Okay, well, I think time has run short and yes. so well. Thank you all very much. And thank you, Dianita, for, for the invitation. I hope this was helpful and well, see you around. Wonderful, thank you so much. I love the way that you have so many ideas and tech things. Tengo envidia de la buena, por supuesto. I'm gonna take your class. Esa no existe, la envidia la buena no existe. Anyways, thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Caro, for sharing your experience, your knowledge mm -hmm. with us. Carolina teaches a class in for the first year and, um, and, and it shows many of these things that, mm -hmm. um, uh, that, that she presents today. I'm gonna get yeah. my, my Christmas present. I'm gonna get in, in class flip as a, birth, as a Christmas present. You should sign it. Yeah, I'm gonna send I, it I, over should, to your house. I should get some because um, I don't have any more copies here. Um, I should get some to, to give you one, of course. Well, how do I get your signature on it? I need to, I need to think. <laughs> Uriel, did you already take her class? No, because you're in no. the Masters in ICT Mediated Education. No, anyone here has taken it. I have great memory. <laughs> the thing is, Uriel is in the Masters in ICT Mediated Education, but he's an English teacher. And he's been taking classes like on the Masters in Teaching English as a Foreign Language. And oh. so he's taking all of his IT classes in the other program. Oh, okay. But okay. this is a cool class. Oh yeah, it is a cool class. <laughs> Thank you very much. Andres Ruiz is also on that same boat. He wants to do a master's in ICT mediated education, but he's trying to think on, on how to take some of the classes in the master's in teaching English. <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah, well, if you figure it out, We'll meet there. <laughs> we'll see you there. Thank for you, sure, Carito. Guys, for sure. Very much. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay. you so much. Bye-bye.